So first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk here. What I will be talking about today is uh, a factorization view on states and observables. So let's start with states and observables. We've seen these appear in many talks in the last couple of days. Um, and so let's start maybe on the left-hand side with states. We've seen in Ulrike Tillmann's talk on Monday an approach to a mathematical approach to dealing with states of a field theory, um, namely functorial field theory, inspired from um, topological or conformal field theory, uh, which is axiomatized as a symmetric model of functor here from a bordism category to the category of vector spaces. So for every like bordism, we've seen this is a manifold with an input and an output, you get some linear map. On the other hand, um, if we look at observables, we saw yesterday in John Francis' talk um, certain ways to, to deal with observables of a quantum field theory. And the key word I want to mention here is factorization algebras. And essentially the idea is that you take um, a distant union of little open disks inside a big open disk and you attach a map to it. So these are two different a priori different um, approaches to dealing with certain aspects of quantum field theory. And today I want to show you a very simple example um, of a principle which hopefully will kind of give a bigger picture relating the two. So let's start with the left-hand side. We saw this briefly yesterday. Um, what is a functorial topological field theory? So we have a category of cobordisms on this side and a category of vector spaces on the other side. So to points, we assign some vector space and to some bordism, some linear map between them. Um, and we also saw on Monday that perhaps if we will want to keep this thing of going all the way down to a point, even if we go up in dimension, we still want to include the data of what happens to points. And this is um, encoded by extended topological field theories. And from now on in my talk, everything will be in this way. So we will always go down to points. So for example, in two dimensions, we will add two-dimensional cobordisms. They look something like this. Um, and now we have to kind of do something with our target here. And we still want to keep the property that to a closed top-dimensional manifold, we want to assign an invariant. So we have to kind of put something here on the top, but we will still want to keep the flavor of having some sort of a linear map at the top to keep the invariance. And so one possible thing of putting there is what I called two vect, what I called alg1 here, which is um, algebras, bimodules, and homomorphisms. So if you look, if I just take k, a kk bimodule is just a vector space, and then a homomorphism will just be a linear map. So we recover this thing somehow sitting in these two layers here. And now if we go even up in dimension, add something three-dimensional, then we will want to add even more layers here. So one choice of such a possible three-vec is something I will call alg2, and its objects are E2 algebras, and there's a more notion of bimodules, and then of bimodule with bimodules and homomorphisms. So again, you see kind of in these three layers here, we recover something like what we had before. Okay, so these are, these are not the only possible two vec, three vec that we want to have, but these are the ones that we will be talking about in this talk. So another good example here for a two vec would be something like k linear categories, functors, and natural transformations, but just as an outlook. So these alg1, alg2, I denoted them suggestively by having a 1 and a 2 there. You might ask, well, what about n? And yes, in fact, there is a generalization of this um, for arbitrary n. And even better, I mean, we were talking about algebras and bimodules, which in particular are vector spaces. But you could also ask for something like an algebra in categories. That would be a monoidal category or then bimodules of them. So we, we have some freedom in choosing to put some other category in here, S. Um, and this was joint work, partially. Um, and Rune Hauksang also had a different approach to this, giving some models for what these Morita categories could be. So applications of this um, are, in this example of taking K linear categories, K linear functors, natural transformations, you can stick this into our construction. And this is a natural home for a th 
this, this will be a three category. And this is a natural home where tensor categories live. So this is like the, the desired target that you would have for a Turai Vero type theory. Um, or you could stick it into this ALG2 construction, and then the objects in here will just be braided monodal categories. So for example, um, representations of a quantum group or things like that. So Yes, so I mean, you have to have, yes, so you have to have, I mean, I've been suppressing details here, you have to have suitable, nice, k-linear categories for this. You will want to have a Dillian tensor product, absolutely. I'm just suppressing these technicalities, yes. So in light of the cobordism hypothesis, um, we've also seen this before, and maybe in this um, thing, I want to emphasize that the Comborism hypothesis gives you quite strong finiteness conditions on the types of objects that you can use. So the Comborism hypothesis um, tells you something about these TFTs. So these, for me, this will always mean the extended TFTs that we saw in Monday's talk. And um, these, this is just the, the space of all um, extended n-dimensional topological field theories with this framing the manifolds are always equipped with a framing. And what you can do to such a thing, I said, we always go down to a point. So I can take the point, I can evaluate at a point and see what I get. That will be this functor. So I land in my NVECT. But in fact, the cobordism hypothesis tells you much more. Well, this is just the way it is. The cobordism hypothesis tells you that in fact you land in this part in the middle. Um, forget about this part. This just says that you're taking a groupoid. But you're taking the part of NVECT where your objects and morphisms have finiteness conditions, and dualizability conditions. And furthermore, this, this map here is it not only factors, this part here is an equivalence in a suitable way. So that means um, this gives you somehow a way of constructing extended TFTs. You just have to find objects in here. Yes, that's why one is in script and one is not in script. <laughs> so it means n-dualizable. <laughs> so in the examples that we had before, um, n equals one, you just get a finite dimensional vector space. n equals two, you get finite dimensional semi-simple algebras. For n equals three, we can take this algebra one of cat that I was talking about before. Then you get like finite semi-simple tensor categories. So you see, you always get these very strong finiteness conditions, semi-simplicity, something like that. And I mean, even the first condition is maybe a little bit unsatisfying if you think of quantum mechanics. Well, quantum field theory, you usually will get infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces. So topological field theories just, just impose these strong finiteness conditions. There's not much we can do. Well, is there? So I want to talk about an approach to maybe um, how to be able to relax these conditions a little bit. And this goes under the name of twisted field theories. This has nothing to do with topological twisting or half twisting or things like that. So this is a bit of an unfortunate um, coincidence there. Um, I would like to call them relative field theories, but relative field theories mean something else. They mean boundary field theories. So also not to confuse them with that. <laughs> But the idea is the following, and I see the typesetting didn't really work very well, but the a field theory, and uh, a functorial field theory, was just a functor into something over there. So now if I take two such functors, well, if I have functors, symmetric monodal functors, I have a notion of a morphism between functors, which is just a natural transformation, a symmetric monodal natural transformation. So just for, as a mathematician, I can just write this down. I want a natural transformation. Um, the idea is that you want to take either S or T to be just the theory that assigns K to everything. And the other is what we will call a twist. So why, why on earth would you want to maybe look at something like this? Well, on a closed manifold, then we, can, we will just evaluate here to get a vector space. Um, and so in the, in the first case, if, if S is, is just K, what this Z will assign is just a map from K to T of M. So we just get an, pick out an element in the vector space T of M. Or in the other situation, 
um, if I set t equals to k, we just get a covector in the vector space S of m. And so now if you think of it, um, yes, so as a technical aside, if you're dealing with this extended case and, and higher categories, then you have to have a, a suitable notion of natural transformation here, and this will just, this is called lax or oplex natural transformations, but I don't want to go into details on this today. So let's start with a, a simple example. So the first looks maybe a little bit um, technical, but if we look at one-dimensional examples with target my favorite two vect alt one. So these will be fully determined by a morphism A to B, which is a bimodule, M from A to B. So A is what is associated to this S, and B is the analog of this T, evaluated at a point. And the condition that we get is that um, we want this morphism to just have a left adjoint in a categorical sense. What does that mean? It just means it's finally presented a projective over A. Or in this other case, um, it's finally presented a projective over B. So an example, a quite simple example, is take some vector space, possibly infinite dimensional, and view it as a bimodule for its endomorphisms. And so now, if you ask V to be finitely presented in projective over K, that's exactly the finite dimensionality that you get in window realizability. But if you ask it to be finite presented in projective over N V, if you just have a, a vector space, this will always be true. Um, if you deal with topological vector spaces and so on, possibly it's not always true, but if just more ordinary vector spaces, this is just always true. So we always get such a lax twisted theory, even for infinite dimensional things. But now it's in a relative situation relative to its endomorphisms in some sense. Okay, so this should exhibit, I mean, this was a very simple example, but should exhibit a bigger picture. So the philosophy that um, Stefan Stortz and Peter Teichner have about these twisted field theories, why they kind of introduced them, is that somehow what were the endomorphisms of the vector space. If I think of V as being the state space, the endomorphisms of V will be something like the observables. So the philosophy should be something like, well, we have the observables, the factorization algebra of observables possibly that we saw yesterday, or the, the point operators as they were called in, um, in both uh, Francis and Ben Zvi's talks. And then we have Z somehow going from the observables to just my K. So that's something like the data that we had yesterday, the trace. So that's somehow the, the idea or the philosophy behind what this should be. And in the topological case, again, fully extended, um, one can actually realize this twist functor um, as a factorization homology of an EN algebra, um, where the target is like my favorite target algen. So this is very the topological situation. You, you might want to ask about more general cases, but that's not there yet. But at least in the topological situation, we can make this top arrow here precise. And um, yes, Peter, uh, Peter Teichner and Stefan Stolz also have this top arrow in the unextended case and the twist in the unextended case. Uh, yes, in general. All right, but back to our example. So we will want to now generalize example from before to dimension two. Um, and in the two-dimensional situation, I have to give you a little bit of abstract nonsense before, before I can show you the results. So we will want to generalize this example of having a vector space relative to its endomorphisms. And so the technical theorem that we will need is that my target category, ALG2, which I will want in that situation, is actually what's called fully two-dualizable. Um, in other words, objects have duals and morphisms have adjoints. And the other technical result that we need is um, in this situation, we can characterize the morphisms um, which, which give you such two-dimensional twisted field theories. Um, and we have conditions like, well, we have a unit and co-unit out of injunction and these have left adjoints or things like that. So, so you have like the morphism has a left adjoint and the data associated to it again have left adjoints. Weird one-sidedness conditions like that. 
So this is an abstract nonsense. Let's look at it in practice. Um, the example we will want to have is, remember we wanted to have a vector space and its endomorphism. So now, going up one category level, we can replace the vector space by an algebra. And what's the analog of the endomorphisms of an algebra? Well, I claim this will be the Hochschild cohomology, Z of A. So Z of A is actually the derived endomorphisms of A viewed as an AA bimodule or the derived center of A. So if you don't know what these things mean, just think of the center of an algebra, all elements which commute with every other element. So this is the center you know is commutative by definition. Um, and the nice thing here is that this derived center is not fully commutative, but it's like a little bit more commutative than just associativity. That's what we saw yesterday and on Monday appearing all over again. It's an E2 algebra. And um, moreover, the center acts on A itself, so we get a bimodule, A as a bimodule for its center. And this is, this, this is the element, the, the morphism that we will want to, want to um, use as a replacement for V as a relative to endomorphisms. And so what, what are the conditions um, unraveled from above? This morphism, this bimodule, determines a twisted field theory if and only if A is smooth and proper over Z of A, okay? So before we had semi-simple and finite dimensional, and this here is the appropriate analog of this semi-simple and finite dimensional, of um, separable and finite dimensional. And uh, so explicitly, um, what this means is A has a left adjoint as an algebra for the center, and A has a left adjoint as an algebra for A tensor A op over Z of A. There's a little subtlety here about how this acts and how this tensor product is. Um, I'm happy to show that later if somebody is interested. So in the underived situation, if we just have an ordinary center, what does that mean? Let's look at a simple example of the situation. Um, we can take A to be the polynomial differential operators in characteristic P, the Weyl algebra. And let's just take the underive, the usual center. And then the conditions that I've just written up, uh, written down, is that A should be finitely presented and projective over Z of A, and A should be separable over Z of A. And these are two conditions you can check, have been checked, and are true. In fact, A is even Azumaya. That's much stronger than this condition here. So this is, at the moment, the best example that we have, and it's a little bit simple and stupid, so this is also a question for the audience, whether you have seen um, more examples, maybe derived examples of this type. One hope that we have is to fit the B model into the situation. Um, if you have a variety, M, and you take the GG category of coherent sheaves, then it's a fact that this is too dualizable if and only if M is smooth and proper. Um, but somehow the modifications of the above, so this is a DG category, it's not an algebra, but um, that's not a problem. So modifications of what we have, what we had above, um, sh should actually just need that it's smooth and proper over the Hochschild cohomology, so the polyvector fields. Um, and to connect to factorization algebras, I mean, this has been co constructed by, by C. Lee somewhere in the audience, and I mean, this is, this is something that should fit nicely, hopefully, into the framework, but um, we still have to somehow check the conditions. Okay, thank you. <laughs>